Hey guys, so today we're going to talk about traits of maintainable app architecture, and I will focus on more practical advice rather than theoretical knowledge, because you can always read the books about design patterns, and they're written by people with far more experience than most of iOS developers are. And uh, I will also look at two major UI architecture patterns and discuss how they can be improved uh, by using yet another pattern to just make it easier for us to write maintainable applications. So who am I? I am an iOS consultant. I currently lead development at the New York Times. Uh, but I also often get hired to help teams improve their app architecture, to review their source code, and to make them more efficient, basically. And my open source projects are powering up more than 30,000 applications right now. And last eight years, I spent working on tools and libraries to make our life a little bit easier. Like one of the most popular things you might have heard of is sorcery. I also have my own indie company when I have an app called Foldify, which is Apple Essential. And I had to maintain it for the last six years, so I know a little bit about the pain of maintaining apps for a long time. And how important is it to create an architecture that's maintainable? I believe that you have to think about it before you start writing. You cannot just you know, get an idea for a project and just start mashing your keyboard. That's usually a way to get into a lot of pain later on. And this will differ between the kind of work that we do, because some of us work in product companies, so we focus on a single or like couple of products that power up our business and make us money. The other side of the road is people that work in consulting agencies. When you get hired to implement a 1.0 version of an application, and then usually that application goes back to the product owners and in-house development. So this is a little different, right? Because when you have to write a product that will work for you for years, you have to think about the architecture a lot, right? Because it's something that you will be making money on for the next five, six years, hopefully, or even more. So it's, it's crucial. It's crucial to think about the architecture. When you work for software agency, oftentimes people don't actually get to validate whether their architecture choices are the correct ones because they work on a project for a couple of months and then it's out of their way. So I think even with, when you work in software agency, I think you should focus on architecture because if I am the person that's going to take over the project that you wrote, and I, you know, I see who wrote, work on it, right? People usually leave their name on the headers, and it's like it's a very bad sign if the architecture is just bad, right? You don't want to leave a bad impression, and so it's, it's, I think it's something that we should all care about, regardless where we work. So, what are some of the traits of good application architecture? Dependencies should be isolated and easy to change. Like You don't want to have a strong dependency on external provider that can go out of business. Uh, objects should have clear boundaries. You should be able to follow the data flow with ease. Like When you have bugs, you want to understand what's happening easily, rather than having to you know, actually sit down and write everything up and try to figure out what's actually happening behind the scenes. I think it's crucial to be able to debug the code, because we are all like, if you were smart writing the code, how hard, how hard you have to work to figure out what's wrong with it, right? It's much harder to debug than it's to write a new, new implementation. And it has to be testable, both through manual and automatic tests. And I like to say that it should be flexible, but because it's simple, not because it's over-abstracted. You don't want to have flexibility by having hundreds of protocols, everything, you know, just anticipating some future change that might never happen, because that usually just leads to more complexity. And I believe to keep things as simple and stupid as possible. And you want to prioritize good developer experience. Because at the end of, of, of the day, this is what we do every day, right? If, you're, if the way you work is annoying, it's hard for you, it's like if, you, if your architecture, if your process requires a lot of manual steps, requ requires a lot of boilerplate, a lot of repetitions, it's just not a nice project to work on, right? So developer experience, I think it's crucial because when you have that, when you feel like you, know, you sit down and you start writing code and you can just see the results and you don't have to do unnecessary work, you can just experiment more, tweak more, adjust the little things. And I think on iOS especially, like 
pushing for the little detail. It's what makes the difference between a good app and a great app. And I think that's like part of the developer experience benefits. Uh, why do you want limited dependencies? Like one of the things is parse. Probably a lot of people still remember parse. Foldify, which is my app, my app uh, used parse, and I was very happy with it because it allowed me to not write backend, and I'm not a backend developer. But the thing with parse is when Facebook bought it, a lot of people anticipated issues, and they, they were right because Facebook decided to shut it down. And then you had a couple of months to get rid of that dependency, migrate all your data, and update your code base, right? So the thing here, if you were using parse everywhere in your project, that's a massive amount of work you have to now do to replace all the data models because they gave you like base classes, all the backend has to be migrated to new server, all the API endpoints have to be created from scratch or moved to like a, another provider. And now if you design your architecture with just a small layer in between parse and your code, that would be trivial. Like for us, for Foldify, it was like two days of work to get rid of parse from the app itself because there was like a simple protocol that get rid of the direct dependency. So you want to use stuff like that. With separation of concern, you want to have very clear boundaries of what an object does, right? If you have, um, if you look at an entity in your project, you should be able to tell what it's responsible for. And most of the time, a single object should just be doing one thing. Like I say most of the time because sometimes you have objects that serve as coordinators between different entities. So some, some people might think that this is doing more than one thing, but in general, it's just managing it, right? So it's still a single role. And testability, this is cru crucial. I think this is like probably the best thing you can do if you don't do it yet. And TDD can help us create better architecture in many ways. So first of all, what I like to think about is it changes the perspective because when you write your APIs, if you do it in a void, if you do it in like a back in Objective C, you would have the interface files, right? So you define the interface before you actually have to use it. With tests, it's a little different because when you write tests first, you put yourself in the role of API consumer because you write the, the call that you're about to be testing before it actually exists. So you see how the API will look at the call side. And that actually makes it much better because what you end up doing is API that just feels right, like the naming, the, the arguments, the, the way the, the code is structured just makes, makes it much better. And then you end up doing less refactoring later on as you maintain your project. The other thing is if your tests are hard to write, that usually means that your architecture has something wrong with it. Like for example, if you cannot test that um, your cache implementation deals with files correctly, that's usually a sign that you are using a singleton rather than injecting the dependency that deals with the file. So for example, you could use file manager, right? File manager default, that's what a lot of people do. But you could just make a simple protocol because you, only, you usually only use a couple of functions from the file manager for specific classes. So you could just create a protocol and inject it directly. Then in tests, you can use a fake and you can test everything, which is beautiful because it makes it much easier to reason about the code. And when you refactor, it gives you a lot of confidence. So I think that a lot of people would say that they don't have resources to do tests. And I have to disagree with that because I believe that the smaller the team, the bigger the benefit is. And the reason behind this is simple. I work in a big company right now. I work with the Times. We have our QA team. We have a dedicated people that are meant to just test the changes we are doing, right? If you work in a small team, you usually don't have QA people. You are the QA people. The developers, the designers, the product owner, everyone is QA. The thing is, if I'm working on a project like for a while and I decide that the architecture that I designed in the beginning doesn't stand the, you know, the test of time, and I would like to change it, if I don't have tests, that is a really scary thing to do. Because how I am going to verify that I just didn't break half of the project? I would have to go through every feature, every use case, and try and see if it still works, right? This is a lot of work for people that are not, you are not supposed to be the tester, right? You, you should test your code, obviously, but 
you should not have to test the whole application every time you make a decision to refactor or something. So in Foldify, I was the only developer. The app has a couple of million of downloads. So now if I decide to refactor the architecture, I'm just opening myself a lot of pain if I don't have test coverage. If I have test coverage, that gives me confidence to change the code. Because at least the stuff that I had tests for, I know I didn't introduce regressions. So this is a huge benefit. And I think the, like, the smaller the team, really, if, if you have just a few people, you should focus on testing more. So how do you convince your client if you work as a consultant? Or, if you, or your team, because a lot of people don't know how to do tests. And I think this, this comes back to, like, we are hired as a professionals, right? If you're a consultant, you're hired because someone considers you someone good. If they had their own skill set in their um, team, they would not hire you because what would be the point, right? So when I hire people to build my flat, I don't tell them how to do it. So this is a very strong opinion, but I think that when I get hired to do the whole application from the scratch, it's up to me how it's done, right? I estimate the time it's needed. I estimate, I decide what architecture will there be based on the business goals and like the uh, resources that the client has, like how, many how much time can I spend on it. And so when I get hired to write the whole application, most of the time I will write tests because once you learn how to do tests, you actually get faster with testing. Like a lot of people say, I cannot do tests because it takes too much time. But in fact, once you learn how to do tests properly, it takes less time with tests. Because if your API is not ready, you can just mock it. You can just work against the test fake data, implement all parts of your features, right? And while the backend is being done. When the backend is finished, you just test whether they adhere to the contract that you guys agreed on. So it makes you more efficient. So I think it's, it's, like, it's hard to argue against tests once you know how to do them correctly. So what are some simple signs of wrong application architecture? So for example, if you run this command and something comes out uh, that has thousands of lines of code, that usually means your files are breaking single responsibility principle because an app delegate of 4,000 lines of code it's never good. Same with the view controllers. Unless, you, you know, unless someone just puts a lot of classes in a single file, this is actually a good sign to see, okay, these are the files that I should be looking at if I'm going to improve something. The other thing you can do is look for signs of global shared state, uh, which makes it really hard to test. And it's not how singletons are meant to be used. Like the idea behind singletons is, I'm going to talk about it in a minute, but global state sync is not the right way to do it. So if you're using app delegate as your dependency injection container, that's not how you should be using this. This is not how it works. Uh, what you can do is you can use either sorcery or something like dependency graph, uh, dependency visualizer, just to graph everything in your app. And if you look at this, you see co points of contention. The resolution is not really great, but there is an app delegate that a lot of lines go to, and that's another sign that something is wrong. What's nice about using um, dependency visualizer, it, it finds places that you could modularize your app into. So if you find a lot of places, like a couple of classes that have a lot of uh, lines going to them, that's usually a place where you could create a separate framework and extract those parts of code, which will improve the modularity of your API. So quick note about design patterns. I think that uh, you have to think about design patterns like your toolkit. You have to be pragmatic about it. It's not meant to be like, if I decide that my project is going to use MVVM or it's going to use MVC, it doesn't mean I have to blindly follow this, right? There are situations, like parts of your project, when it makes sense to use a different approach. And it's fine to do it. It's not about, you know, it's about having a clear and clean code that you can understand and maintain rather than, you know, being very, like people get very excited about this. And like, this is the only right way to do things. That is never a good sign. So you have to use design patterns like a tool for a specific problem. And you can still abuse design patterns. Like the best design, even composition, you could use, like composition is beautiful, but 
it still can be used wrong, right? So singletons. Singletons get a bad rap in any IT industry. But the idea behind singleton is not inherently bad. The idea behind it is to deal with resource contention. Like there are literally things that can only exist in one instance. If you work with hardware, you might just get one, uh, one, like one uh, handle to some external resource, right? To like a, a like database access. Like if you use the like modern day databases, give you like multiple readers and a single writer a lot of the time. But back in the day. Sometimes you only could have one open connection to the database, right? So that was the idea behind Singleton. Like, this is actually limitation, and we have to have one instance. If, if you have more than one, that's not going to work. So that's what, how it was created. The problem is people use it to wrap globals and just to make it easier to get access to data rather than using dependency injection. An example of Singleton might be a logger. Like, most apps just have a single logger interface because every part of the app will need logging at one point or another, right? So why do people keep abusing singletons for global shared state? Because referencing to global is very easy. If I want to log something, just writing logger shared is trivial, right? I can do it in any single, basically any class in the project, and it's not an issue. But the thing, that the issue is, like for logger, people don't usually test logs, but if it's like a file manager, now you're making it hard for yourself to test your code and change the implementation. And the reason people do it is because they don't think about architecture up front. So this is the only way that they can do it that doesn't require changing a lot of classes. Like if at some point I'm working on a project and I actually need to lock something, and this is like deep, like the fifth screen that I'm showing in the app, if I don't use like different patterns for the architecture, that might require me to change all the five screens before. I'm going to mention that in a second. But there are workarounds. Like with Swift, you can use protocol-oriented uh, programming. So for example, you can create a protocol called Logable that the default implementation actually uses Singleton, but it's all hidden. And in tests, you could override it, because the default implementation can be ex changed into like a specific one. So you could even test this. The other advantage is you could have like a default logging tag. So for example, you could mark an object as uh, part of view controller layer. And then it's better, like you get better logs. So there's a lot of things like that. And my favorite pattern by far is composition. And this is, if, if there was one pattern, I would I recommend anyone to master would be this pattern. And the reason is because it leads to other patterns very easily. So. If you use composition, you will basically always do single responsibility principle, because that's just like a single object that does a small thing that gets injected into other things. By contract, it's going to just do one thing, right? And it's also going to do dry because of it, because if it's, if it's extracted already to do a single thing, you can just reuse it everywhere. So there is no reason to repeat your code. Also, Swift leverages value types, which doesn't allow you to do inheritance. So this is already you know, it's a step into using composition more. And because of all those things, it makes it much easier to test. Because if it's a simple, simple, pro, simple object that has a simple interface, usually just one or two public uh, functions, then there is less permutations to test. So your test suite will be very straightforward to do. And it's easy to rearrange, because those objects can be used in different parts. You can introduce different objects. And it's far better than inheritance. And the reason I say it's far better by, for inheritance is an example of games. If anyone ever worked in game dev, I have a background in making games when I was younger. And the mo by far the most popular pattern in game dev is using entity systems. Entity system is basically a composition pushed to the maximum. Rather than having an object use inheritance, rather than having a player being a class that um, inherits from like a, a, peep, a person or something, and then enemy being another class. We don't do that in games. Most of the time, what we do is we create an entity, and an entity can get modules attached to it. A module might be ability to walk, or ability to shoot uh, projectiles. And Unity uses uh, entity systems. And if you look at games that are created with Unity, you go from 2D games that are based on physics to like full-blown 3D AAA level games with beautiful graphics, with really complex gameplay. 
And this just proves how flexible composition is. And it's really, if you never did game dev, I would encourage you to read about it because this is really powerful. And by far, like Unreal Engine, all those game engines use this pattern. That's the core of it. And it just makes it more flexible. So let's talk about dependency injection very quick. So dependency injection goes very well with composition because of all the things it, it uh, said. And it allows you to basically swap the components when testing or when configuring it for different use cases. And Apple recommends it, but they do it completely wrong. So let's just quickly look at MVC versus MVVM. Those two, two most popular patterns that are often discussed in our community. First thing to remember that a lot of people get totally wrong, this is not an architecture pattern. This is a UI architecture pattern. That's a, like a big difference. You still have to design your data processing, all this stuff. So UI pattern, UI architecture pattern. This is what Apple, well, this is what MVC is me was meant to, the view was dump, rendered by controller when the model changes. That's how it used to work in web. Uh, very hard to apply in iOS since our UI kit is very tightly coupled. This is what Apple says that MVC looks like. Controller mediates between the view and the model. And the controller obviously is the least reusable part because of the hard dependencies. This is what it actually looks like in real projects because the view controller is very tightly coupled to lifecycle events on, on the view. So what happens is you have to treat view controller as part of the view layer. So you don't actually have real controller in MVC sense in iOS, which, yeah, it's, that's what leads to a lot of problems. So a lot of people will use the fact that their application is using MVC as an excuse to write bad code. I worked on projects, I worked on projects that used MVC that were written very well, that were very easy to maintain, and uh, like the quality was impressive. Like I get hired to review projects, and I like I was blown away by some some of the MVC implementations I've seen. And they all leverage composition. They all avoid big view controllers. Instead, they would create controller, actual controllers that dealt with like, very small parts of the behaviors in the application and be reused across different screens. They, would, they would use uh, conta container view controllers as well. So rather than having a screen being a single view controller, they would create multiple ones and just use you know, parts of it. And uh, when you leverage composition, you can test a lot of the code. So even with MVC, you can have a test, test coverage that's pretty decent. And you can learn more about MVC from Dave DeLong. He has a talk about it here. And yeah, just don't use it as an excuse to write bad code. MVVM is a little different. It's only slightly more complicated than MVC is. Uh, what's important is you have to treat both UI view and UI view controller as part of the view layer. That's crucial in both patterns on iOS. And there is no tight coupling between the view and the model. And this usually requires some kind of binding library. It doesn't require full FRP library like Reactive Cocoa or XSwift. You can write a simple observable to deal with forwarding the data to the views. And it can be like 100 lines of implementation, which is very simple. But both of those patterns miss one thing. And it's a big problem on iOS, especially since our apps usually have multiple screens. It's rare for our app to have a single screen. Uh, yeah, modernly, like, it might look like there is a single screen, but there is way more, right? It, like, only due to, like, the user experience, people would make it appear that it's like a single screen that just transforms from one to another, but there is a lot of logic in the apps. So the biggest problem is lack of router or dependency injection containers. Uh, so the idea of router or coordinator, how I call it, is something that allows us to make dependencies easier and dependency injection in general. Apple talked about dependency injection on the WWDC. They pissed the hell out of me because what they did is this is how they show it. So a circle is a view controller. The letter in the circle is a dependency. So you start your project, you write your first, first view controller, um, and it has a single dependency called A. Then you do another view controller, which has a dependency called B, right? So this is how basically the correlation is, right? You have the A, and then you push the B. The problem is with what, how Apple recommended it is to inject from one view controller to another, which sounds fine if you have just a single screen. Okay, that's, that's doable. But what happens? 
uh, I went too far. What happens if you have multiple screens, if you have multiple configurations of your screens? The first view controller or view model becomes a sync for all the dependencies in your project. Even though it only uses A, it ends up with A, B, C, D, E, right? All of those dependencies. Then the next one has all become other than the first one, right? So now you look at the implementation of your first view controller and you have no idea what it actually needs, right? If you want to test this code, if you want to test the first view controller, you have to inject all fakes for all the dependencies. So it's not readable what it actually needs, and it's really hard to test. This is a terrible way to do dependency injection. And this is because you don't have something that fills the role of router or coordinator. So this is how code might look, right? You have an if statement, and depending whether your app is running it on iPad or on iPhone, you have a different presentation style. One is a model and the other, or like a popover, and the other is just a push, right? So this kind of code, it's terrible. It creates conditional logic dependencies, and it's really hard to maintain in your projects. And this is just simple, right? This is not how it looks anymore, because we have size classes and we have multitasking. So there is way more configurations to deal with. So it creates a lot of spaghetti code. So lack of router leads to unnecessary dependencies. It leads to tight coupling between different screens that don't need to know about it, each other's. That forces you to have less of reusable code, because since it's like it knows the where it is in the app flow, you cannot reuse the same view controller easily in a different place. And oftentimes that would be the case, right? Because you would, for example, user screen might be shown from multiple different parts. Like if you are like an Instagram app, right? You have your own user profile, but then you also have user profile of other people. So the same screen with different data shown from different contexts. And yeah, it's really annoying. And testing is really hard. Like with this, terrible. I don't want to test this. I, I know why people don't like testing, because of this. Because of all the unnecessary work you have to do. So this is where flow coordinators come in. There are two articles you should read. One is written by me, and the other is written by Sarush. And basically, it's a rotor-like pattern. A lot of people came up with similar approaches for this. Those are the two articles that I like, mostly because I wrote, wrote one of them. Uh, what happens with flow coordinators is the flow coordinator takes over owning the dependencies. It has A, B, C, D, E, but then each screen only needs the dependence, it only gets the dependency that it actually needs. So when you look at the code, you know what it needs because it never gets something to pass to something else, right? It gets what it actually uses, which makes it easier because then if I want to test each of those view controllers, I only fake one object rather than five or six. Also, there is no hard connection between different view controllers. So the same view controller can be reused in multiple scenarios. And the flow coordinator decides how this is reused. So it creates the view controller or the view model. It configures it based on the context. So for example, an image picker might be configured differently from the settings screen when you change your profile photo versus when you create a post on an Instagram, right? It might be the same image picker. And based on context, iPad, iPhone, or using containment, you can present it in different scenarios. And the flow coordinator will listen to the events that view controller and view model has, right? An event might be selecting an item from a list. That's an event. And the, view, the flow coordinator just injects a closure, intercepts that, and does whatever it needs. So it might show a popover, or it might push another view controller. And it injects all the objects that this view controller or view model needs to fulfill their role. So for example, an implementation might look like this. So configure program view controller, it injects the state, which might be a view model, and it injects a trigger for add program, which is the event that it listens to. And in add program, it just creates a new view controller and it pushes it. But if this was shown on a different context, right? If this was configured from um, like multitasking or something, there would be a different function that just gets executed. So rather than having a lot of its statements, this makes it much easier. And with MVVMC, the view model has no knowledge about the presentation. Usually you don't even import UI kit, which is beautiful, because you don't have to create views. It has black box interface for all the triggers, and it's very easy to test. Since no views have to be created, you can actually reproduce 95% of bugs without ever having views. Because 
the way view models work is they expose all the triggers that your UI would be able to do. So it exposes like pressing a button. There is a function on the view model that you can call from your test that simulates user pressing a button. So now when you get a bug report, you can write tests that do the user steps without actual UI. And reproducing UI state is very, very hard because there are so many lifecycle events. So this makes it much easier. There might still be bugs on the connection between the view model triggers and your UI, but that's easy to catch. And you can have, uh, you can have UI tests for that, just to see the connections working. This deals with a lot of trouble that the testing usually carries. And it allows you to reuse the view models very easily. A quick mention about something that people miss, because usually when we talk app architecture, we talk about UI app architecture. So there's also data architecture, other than just displaying stuff. How do we get this stuff into the application in a nice way? Like a lot of times, I would get people saying that um, they are blocked waiting for the API or like another team doing something because they don't have the data to fire and actually work with UI or different parts of the application. But most of the time, when I work on projects, I finish the native part before the backend is even done. And the, the reason I can do it is because I structure my API architecture, my data architecture as a pipeline. So I use protocol at each stage, and I have like uh, an example might be I have a data provider that just gives me a raw data. I have a decoder that transforms that into simple Swift objects. And then I have a model converter that converts that into whatever the UI layer uses. And then it's consumed by that UI layer, right? So how does this help? It's pretty simple. If I need to write tests for the view model, or I need to reproduce a specific data for a bug, what I can do is I can just short uh, use shortcut here, right? I can get rid of the model converter. No, none of the parts before are needed anymore. And I just replace it with uh, fake data. And now I can, I can launch the screen with a specific data configuration that the user saw when the bug was there, or I can just run tests against it. And this, was great. this works great for static data, but it doesn't, deal, doesn't allow you to verify data mutations, which is something that most of the bugs are. Right? It's not immutable data that causes a lot of issues. It's the fact when you have the data that changes over time. So how can we do it? Right? So I want to see how the whole application reacts uh, to specific data changes, and the backend isn't ready, right? So I'm blocked. I go back and I'm like, oh, sorry, I couldn't work on this since they didn't finish. It's their fault. Pay for my time. Uh, yeah. So what can I do? I can create a framework. I can create a framework that allows me to load data either from my desktop or from remote resource, like a Dropbox or a HWS server, and I want real-time updates. So I actually created something like this called File Watchers, and it just has very, this very simple framework just has two classes, local and remote, and it can be used to observe changes to resources, right? So how does it work with a data pipeline like this? So that's why I split it so granularly, because now the stuff that provided raw data from the API can give me raw data from anywhere, right? So I just put my JSON file on my desktop when I'm working on a simulator, and I just have a file watcher adapter, which is three lines of code, literally. And this is how the Times did our um, initial work. This is a video from like two years ago when we didn't have the servers ready. And as you can see, as I change the data and I save the file, the simulator reloads, and I can observe the changes. So we use this to work on different layouts in the application and all the architecture before the backend was even was even giving us two uh, hundreds, right? Responses. The backend was not there at all, and this allows us to work independently from them. And this made it so much easier and so much more efficient. And we were no longer bound by the external teams. We didn't have to coordinate. We just had an agreement how the API is supposed to look like. We faked it on our side. We used a JSON file. And we are using something like this right now because we are doing changes to how the presentation will work. We will have a very different view of the articles in the application. And uh, if it's not even me working, someone else is doing it. And they just like did a demo three days ago, and they showed that they were using File Watcher as well. So they could change the data how the backend would normally, except it's much faster. And the, the data pipeline architecture makes this trivial. So in summary, 
There is no silver bullet. I think that you should evaluate each project requirements separately. And uh, definitely testing. This, this is something I would do for any project if I only can. If I have full control over a project, it's going to have tests. It's just easier. Like, I do a lot of open source, and I cannot open source anything without tests anymore, because it's impossible to maintain. I think I have like 20 open source projects. And if I open source anything without tests and I get pull requests, it requires me to spend hours evaluating whether they didn't break something, which makes it impossible, right, with the amount of projects. If I have tests, the only thing I care about is not breaking previous, previous tests that covered all the use cases and getting new tests for the new functionality. It makes my, my life much easier. And in commercial work, that's even more important because we get paid for this, right? And you want to follow solid principles, obviously. And I think it's important to make it flexible by making it simple. And don't over-engineer with a lot of abstraction, a lot of protocols. Keep it simple. It, the requirements always change. I have never worked on a project that would get requirements up front and they would actually be what, was, what the project was at the end. Never happens. So what you want to do is keep it simple, but you don't want to, you know, you don't want to anticipate that everyone will change, everything will change, and create hundreds of protocols and have everything abstracted. And then when you try to change it, you realize you have to touch so many files, so many objects, because everything is just so complex because of the over-engineering. So this is, I think, this is a big takeaway. And I think you should think about developer experience, like the file watcher thing made our life easier, made us more efficient, and it was trivial to implement. Like the implementation of the tool is like 200 lines of code maybe, and it made us save weeks of work that we could you know, say, we are blocked, we cannot work on layouts because we don't have the data, or we cannot test the mutations, right? Because like, how are we gonna test it? Like, do I restart the app every time the data changes just to see if the new layout works? This is extremely inefficient, right? The build times in Swift, the time it takes to go to a specific screen that you are working on, this adds up to hours every week that you waste, right? So think about developer tools that you can use and you can, the way you can structure your projects to leverage them and make it easier. And I think the best we can do is to design our architecture in a way that makes the right choices easier than the bad ones. An example of this is singletons. Because if you use flow coordinator, dependency injection is flat. Rather than having a view controller, inject into another view controller, into another view controller. And then at the, after some time, you decide, OK, the last one actually needs one more dependency. So now you have to add it to all of them in the chain, right? It's a lot of changes. If you use flow coordinator, there is one change you have to do, which is to change your final object. And then it just gets injected a new dependency. So this makes it easier to not use singletons. Because now if you decided this is hard, I'm going to add a singleton. It's actually more work, because you have to create the, sh the shared instance. You have to make sure that it's not instantiated more than once. It's actually harder right, to do the bad thing here. So think about that when you design your application. And if you have questions, I'm available after, since we are out of time. So thank you. <laughs>